wonderful, uh, of course, to see all of you here uh, meeting together in peace as we, of course, pray that God will bless us with peaceful place to meet and uh, be able uh, to study his word. And yet, as, as we were last week, and as we still all are today, uh, we're grieving a loss. Grieving a loss of, uh, for all of us, of a local meeting hall. I mean, it's where we've been meeting for a long time. And uh, this fire has, has been quite, uh, quite devastating. And of course, we all know uh, where we were meeting, uh, the location was one that was designed expertly for our use by giving and loving brethren. Some of you quite directly, others of you in assisting, all of us in supporting you know, that and being thankful for that. So uh, we're, we're grieving that, but we're also grieving uh, with the Hoseltons. Uh, with the loss of a clinic, the loss of a, a practice, unless you can figure out how to carry that on in a different location. Uh, that's been serving a community there in Fulton for a couple of decades or several decades. And I'm sure, you know, that the clientele for that, you know, people get used to going to a, a chiropractor or a dentist or a doctor sometimes. Uh, harder and harder to go to a doctor. You can't hardly even get to them. Uh, at a time that's convenient for them, apparently. But it is uh, something that uh, is a loss to the community. And so uh, we, we hurt. We hurt uh, for the Hoseltons as they determine uh, how they, they should proceed in the weeks and months ahead uh, regarding employment and you know, what it is that they're going to need to do to make this kind of a huge adjustment. And I certainly heard uh, for, for Max and, and Jack. Where'd Max go? He disappeared. But I, I heard for the children, for Faith, and Max and Jack, you know, whose lives are kind of turned upside down. You know, I asked Max earlier, you know, how's it been? Well, Everything's been scrambled. Everything, I mean, everything's upside down. Every, you know, in talking to Brian and Carol during this week, you know, things, things are certainly out of the ordinary. You know, there's nothing really kind of consistent here. You know, everything used to be kind of consistent, and certainly with school and, and work, and, and then, you know, at least having another place to head for Brian. Uh, that's, that's something that's... Uh, that's a, a loss, but like I said, I, I heard for our young people, our children, uh, and yet they're in a recovery mode and have a bright future in front of them. Uh, there is much yet to be done. And so even though uh, we are, and there's 20, 25 of us here at times, uh, we're a small group. And yet, generally, I think we know each other quite well. I'm pretty sure all of you know each other. Uh, you help each other out. Uh, you, you serve one another. You love one another. And so I would describe our group here in Fulton or Kingdom City or wherever we are. We're still called Fulton. Uh, as a very loving and very concerned and warm uh, church family. That would be how I would describe uh, all of you. And yet we've gone through what is kind of unimaginable. And yet I want us to look here in 2 Corinthians 4, I want us to look at the, the biblical record of what Paul wrote about. And of course, in this case, he's writing to the congregation that was in Corinth, one that, you know, he, he did, in a sense, raise up. God used him. He was there for a year and a half at least to begin to deal with new members. 
And then ultimately, uh, he needed to kind of straighten out some of their, their uh, questions and problems and things that he needed to help them with. But, and, and I think we commonly, uh, we can reference here in 2 Corinthians how Paul describes, and he even says, I'm speaking as a fool. You know, I've been through everything imaginable, stoning, beatings, lashings, shipwreck, you know, you know we, can, we can identify uh, only in part with much of that because that's, that just sounds like an, an unbelievable life for what Paul was saying. And, but he was talking about himself. He was talking about what he uh, experienced. And yet, and of course he said, you know, and on top of all of that, I've got to deal with people within and without and with false brethren, you know, all kinds of difficulties that uh, he struggled with and then the care of all the churches. You know, he, he cared about every one of the congregations that uh, I think mostly the Gentile world that he had been directly involved in in raising up those congregations. But I want us to look here in 2 Corinthians 4 and, and realize you know, that Paul describes, in essence, the kind of what it is to be called of God and to be enlightened and what we might expect. Here in verse 6, it talks about God has provided light of the knowledge of the glory of God in our hearts. That's what God has done. That's why you're here. Each one of us, you know, as all of us have a certain history in the church, you know, whether we grew up in it or whether we were directly were called by God and we knew that we were called by God to be a part of His church and His work. But it says God has provided light to us. Light about the knowledge of the glory of God. To God's glory and how that he wants to share that glory with each one of us. The ultimately, when you summarize what God's doing, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of being a glorified son or daughter of God. See, that's what eternal life is. Eternal life. See, many people want to go to heaven. You know, they want to go to heaven. They don't know what to do what. But see, to have eternal life is to be a glorified child of God. And yet it says in verse 7, we have this treasure, this, this wonderful enlightenment. We have this in a, a clay jar. You know, we're physical, we're temporary. So that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power that has been extended to us belongs to God. It came from God, and it does not come from us. We didn't just join the church. I often am puzzled by people who tell me, you know, they want to join the church or they want to do, you know, whatever they want to do. I, I, I can often understand that what they're kind of meaning, but see, they're not understanding. You know, God is the one who adds us to the church. That's why we're here. Uh, we're, it's because of His extraordinary power that belongs to Him. And of course, He helps us, but it didn't come from us. He says in verse 8, we're afflicted. So He wasn't just talking about Himself, but He was talking about you know, the, the congregation there, the people in Corinth. It says, we're afflicted in every way. But he says, we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down but not destroyed. See, this is, this is a pretty hopeful statement. 
but it's expressing that while being afflicted or being perplexed or persecuted or struck down is what's going to happen at times. It, it, we don't know when. We don't know, you know how that might affect us, but it says, you know, we're not crushed, we're not driven to despair, we're not forsaken, and we're not destroyed because, it goes ahead in verse 10, always carrying the body, the death of Jesus, that we're reminded, as we just did at the Passover, regarding the holy days, the spring holy days, the days of unleavened bread, uh, we're reminded of Jesus and his sacrifice and his suffering and his example of service. That we're reminded of that and the death that he endured so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. What does God want us to do? Even if we are afflicted or perplexed or persecuted or struck down. Well, he wants us to reflect the life of Jesus. You know, we're, we're a vehicle through which it's always amazing to think about, for me to think about, you know, you read the examples of Jesus and, you know, he gave a lot of uh, teachings, a lot of parables. Uh, he, he served people. Uh, and he, uh, he healed people. He fed people. And whenever you read those, you think, well, man, that, that's God. You know, God actually, Jesus is God. Yes, that's true. But he was in a human form at that point. And he was actually the perfect vehicle through which the Father could be expressed. The perfect vehicle through which, because he said, I'm here to speak the words of the Father. I'm here to do the works of the Father. That's, that's what I'm doing. And he says, you know, you can share in that too. But see, we have to understand that, well, we're a vehicle that could be afflicted and perplexed and persecuted and struck down, but not crushed or in despair or destroyed. <coughs> Verse 11, for while we live, we're always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. And so Paul was speaking of the benefit of Christ working through him and serving the brethren, helping them to be focused, helping them to know, you know, God is still with you. Where, you know, God didn't move away. God is clearly here. And God is clearly uh, going to provide as, as he sees fit. If we drop down to verse 16, we sometimes read these verses uh, somewhat separately. It says, so even, this is, even though this is the case, it says, we don't lose heart. And that's, I think, the direction from God to us. You know, we don't want to lose heart. You know, I don't think we're doing that, but it, it, Paul says, you know, don't lose heart. Realize, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. Our inner nature, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about our, our heart, our mind, our ability to think and reason. You know, we can be refreshed by the Word of God. Uh, we, we have it, it, every one of us have it, easily available to us. Our young people have the Bible easily available to them, probably in more forms than they can even use. And yet, it says, even though our outer nature may be declining, and I can say, you know, I'm, I'm declining more than I was 30, 40 years ago. It seems like I'm getting, it's getting harder and harder to do the same things. But that really is immaterial if I could only focus on the inner nature being renewed day by day, feeding, in a sense, our, our soul our being, feeding that with the Word of God for, it says, this, this momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure because we look not at what we 
what can be seen, but we look at what does we cannot see. For what we, can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. See, we we have to. We do believe. We believe in God. We believe God exists. We believe He rewards those who diligently seek Him. We believe what it says in the Bible, uh, and yet this this is a part of what it says. It says, and we want to keep our focus on God as our Father, Christ as our elder brother, Christ as the head of the church. He's the one. He's the one who has put us in the position to be glorified. We didn't do that on our own. Verse 7 again, we have had this treasure so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and doesn't come from us. It's, it's something that we seek, from, you know, we seek to have. That's why we pray to God and ask for Him to purify our heart, to cleanse our mind, and to, to give us clear clear thinking, a godly mind, godly nature. And that, of course, is, is our, whole, uh, our whole desire. So in light of this, I mean, I think it's good for us to think about how important, how important we are, how important you are to each other. How important is our spiritual family. How important. Every one of you, some of you live in Jeff City, some live in other parts of the country here, some live in Troy, some live in Fulton, Russellville, Ashland. I'm not remembering all the others. Hank lives somewhere. Lee something no it's Holt, Holt. Yeah, Lee Summit is in Kansas City. Hold Summit is down toward Jeff City. And see, we all, God has put us together. He, he expects us you know, to appreciate the fact that we are a, a spiritual family that is a local support group. Have you ever been uh, or felt like you were without a support system? Whether it's your physical family, or whether it's a church support system. See, I've, I've felt that myself. It wasn't something I like to feel. I don't like to feel that way. I don't like to feel like I don't have any kind of a support system. I'm too weak on my own. I need, I need other people. I need to have uh, the, the strength or encouragement or even a help. <laughs> I've, I've told you before, my neighbor, uh, he's, he's quite good with his grass and plants and all the stuff around his house. And he's good with his lawnmower. He likes to mow. He likes to mow. About every other day, he's out there mowing this perfect grass. But then he'll, he'll come over and mow all my weeds down. He, he doesn't care. I mean, I know. He was out there in the dark the other night. And Pat was saying, oh, I don't even really like him out here doing this. Well, I, I, can't, I, I can't run him off, or I'm, I don't want to run him off. I want to encourage. I mean, he's trying to help, I know. And he knows I, I don't get around well, but that's, that's all right. I can eventually get it done, but probably not to his specifications. And yet we all need a support system. And again, whether that's in our physical family, if you have that, you should appreciate that immensely. And then with uh, our, our spiritual family, see that this is what God has caused to be the case of, of all of us. So we, we have to be mindful of the fact that God's calling is more than just to attend church more than just to have a place to go, a place to attend. We want to be able to do that. It's helpful to do that each week. It's a reminder every week. God, God gives us reminders all the time. He must realize that we kind of forget stuff or we overlook it or we need to be reminded. We have a Sabbath every seventh day. 
We have the holy days throughout the year. Uh, we have other reminders at times. Uh, there are certain things that we are um, we are continually needing to be reminded of. Uh, but I I think in just looking at what it says here in Second Corinthians four, we can see well, you know, regardless of what we face, we can face it better together. We can face it better with a support system. And that support system is, uh, is incredibly important. Uh, I wanted to share with you, I think you can see from what, well, let's, let's look at Matthew 12, the, the importance of our, of our spiritual family. See, clearly Jesus had the benefit of a loving family. A family that he was incredibly close to. Mary directly, of course. But even Joseph, who I'm pretty sure taught him a lot of things, gave him certain insights into things. I believe God would have provided for that, for his son to come and be a human for a period of time. And then later, clearly he was aware of his brothers and his sisters, and they probably all had to look up to him because he was, he was perfect, so he, he did things the right way, said things the right way. But here in Matthew 12, it says in verse 46, while he was speaking to the crowds, his mother and his brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. And someone said to him, look, your mother and brother are standing outside wanting to speak to you. But to the one who told him this, Jesus says, well, who is my mother? Who is my mother and who are my brethren? You know, he wasn't saying, I don't know who mom is. I don't know who... I mom is. I don't know Mary. He wasn't saying I don't know James or Jude or Joseph. He wasn't saying that at all. He says, I want, to, I want you to realize there's something more than just the physical family. Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And then pointing to his followers, his disciples, Peter and John and James and you know, the other apostles. He says, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother, my spiritual family. See, that's why it's important to appreciate, you know, having uh, a spiritual family. And that it's not something that should be taken lightly. Unfortunately, actually, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, this was a little easier understood. Today, things are a little more fragmented. I think that's clearly a sad situation. But we all have to know, well, where is God working in my life and in what spiritual family is he working with? See, if we're truly thankful for the spiritual family that God has set us in, see, he's the one who does this. And in our case, it's the United Church of God. We are, we are uh, all considered members of, of the church. But, you know, what makes us a member is to be a, uh, a person who is taught and reminded and guided and led by the Spirit of God. That causes us to have certain qualities and attributes that are godly. And see, that's why we want to grow uh, each other in each other. We want to grow ourselves, but we want to help grow uh, in others those same things. You see Paul continually emphasizing to the congregations 
See, who, who was he talking to in these books like First or Second Thessalonians? He was talking to a congregation there in Thessalonica. Who's he talking to in the book of Colossians? Now the people in the church at Colossae or Ephesians, the people at Ephesus or the people, the Philippian church. That was, that was a congregation. It was like Fulton or Kansas City. You know, he was talking to the people who were a part of a spiritual body who had a god plane relationship with the Father and who were who understood what God was doing in their lives. Of course, they were learning that. He continually emphasized to those congregations the need that they had for each other. Let's look at First, uh, first Thessalonians. See, actually, if you think about it, you can look at each one of the books that I just mentioned. I mean, I'm sure you could look at this in Galatians as well, but I don't have that written down. But let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians, we'll go there first. In verse 2, he says, We always give thanks to the Father, to God, for all of you. See, who was he talking to? The congregation, the group made up of the church of God in Thessalonica. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father, remembering your work of faith and labor of love, your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brethren, beloved of God, or beloved by God, that He has chosen you. He has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became the imitators of us. Does the church have any responsibility to provide an example? See, we covered up some drums up here. You know, somebody was concerned about you know, what we actually might be putting out there, if, you know, remotely as it might be. Uh, it tells us that the church you know, is to provide a pattern and wants to do that. You know, we, we don't always provide the best example, but it says that you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example of all the brethren in Macedonia and Achaia. See, they, they were a shining example here in Thessalonica of the churches in Greece. That, that's what he was saying. All of the areas around know, you know that you are following God, following Paul, and following those who were a part of the church before them. In verse 8, For the word of the Lord is sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia, but also in every place. Your faith in God has become known so that we, we have no need to speak about it. See, this was the way he, he lovingly writes to this congregation about how the impact that they have on each other and even the region around them, on the other congregations. In this case, it would have been, you know, Berea and maybe, I guess, Berea. It looks like there probably was believers there. And Corinth and Athens and Philippi. You know, those were areas that were in Greece that they, they were properly affecting. So let's jump back. We've got some very good examples, and I won't try to cover all of these. Let's just jump back to Philippians. This is another area. Philippians chapter 1, again. Philippians 1, verse 3. 
I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying for, with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel. We are all pulling together to achieve the proclaiming of the gospel. They were doing that locally. Philippi was actually a very important city there in Greece. It was a crossroad city. There was a lot of activity, a lot of Roman activity there. But he says, we're constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion. And that's an important statement to keep in mind because, no, I didn't start my good life on my own. God did. God brought me to an awareness of my need for him. And he's the one who started a good work in us by giving us his spirit. And he says he will. The one who began a good work among you will bring it to, my, to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. See, when's, when that, when's that going to ultimately produce what God wants? Well, when Christ returns. When he returns and there's either a resurrection or a change that occurs to where we can take on the image of the heavenly. That's what God wants for us. And yet he's the one who can do that. It is right for me to think this way, he says, about all of you. Because you hold me in your heart for all of you sharing God's grace with me. Even though I'm in jail, both in my imprisonment and in the defense, confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness that I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ. And this is my prayer that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless and produce a harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. You see Paul basically saying similar things to different groups, but see, he understood they were all, you know, they were all to be guided by God together in appreciating one another and appreciating the calling that God had given them. Of course, when God calls us and when he places before us the, uh, perhaps in a sense, he, he connects with us in such a way that we realize we're wrong, that we need to repent. You know, it also tells us, well, when you repent and when you make a commitment to be forgiven and to be a recipient of the Spirit of the Holy God, that you understand, you know, this is a serious commitment. This is the most serious commitment that we ever make. See, whenever that's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you tend not to remember too much about it, or at least I do. I remember a little bit about being baptized, but I, I know what the commitment was. It was a now on commitment. It was now to the end of my life. And it wasn't uh, to become confused by whatever perplexing uh, affliction. You know, those are all things that he says you can expect. Don't allow your focus to be taken off of that. And, and I think it's good for us to be mindful of that. And, and that even as a small group, and a group with you know, various age groups here, you know, God is, is working very powerfully in us. I want us to look here in Psalm 71. Psalm 71 gives a good overview of this. Psalm 71 is a psalm of David, or I guess it doesn't directly say of David, but it seems like it could be. Psalm 71, verse 5, For you, O Lord, are my hope 
My trust, O God, you are my hope and my trust from my youth. If this was David, it doesn't directly say, but at least this whole chapter points out that this is a lifelong commitment. If it started when we were young, then that's great. If it started when we were midlife, that's great too. If it started when we're older, that's also wonderful. Whenever God chooses to intervene, but he says, For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, from my youth, and upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. And my praise is continually about you. See, our young people can think about that. that that's what... David said about himself, or at least the writer of this psalm. In verse 7, I've been with a, a portent, or I've been a portent to others, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all day long. Do not cast me off. Verse 9, in the time of old age, do not forsake me when my strength is spent. See, that kind of runs the gamut from youth to old age. All of us want to have that kind of, of stability and realize that God is working with us. And if we drop down to verse 17, the same thing is carried, O God, from my youth you have taught me, I will, or I shall de still de declare your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hair, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to all the generations to come. Your power and your righteousness, O God, reach the heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? You have made me to see troubles and calamities will, will revive me again. You will revive me again. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up again. You will increase my honor. You will comfort me once again. See, there's actually a lot of encouragement that the Word of God gives. I know it's a big book. Sometimes it's hard to find everything. Of course, we've got all kinds of help with the computers. You know, you can almost search anything, but if you're really good at that, uh, that may be helpful. Uh, that doesn't help me a whole lot. It, it only, you know, if I understand what it's about, then I can kind of go to that. But if I don't, then I'm not really able to search it that well. But see, what we find is that Paul encouraged the brethren, wherever they were, and under whatever duress, under whatever trial, difficulty that they had, you know, don't be downtrodden. You know, look to God. From our youth or... To those who are older, you know, we all want to continually realize God is the one who is our reference. He, he's the one who will revive. He's the one who will comfort us. You know, it actually comes from Him. And He is clearly, it is important to be mindful of that. So let me close here with just one verse in Luke. Luke chapter 20, or 12, excuse me. Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, you know, Luke is reiterating some of the things that you see Matthew talk about uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. But you, you see how important it is uh, to, to look at different parts of the Bible. Luke chapter 12, verse 30, or verse 31. Let's see, instead, well, let's look, read verse 30, for it is the nations of the world that strive after the things that you might worry about, but your Father knows that you need them. See, we know we have needs, and we have more needs today than we had a couple of weeks ago. But the Father knows. He says He knows that you need them, and He said, strive for His kingdom. These things will be added or given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. See, that's what, that's what God is in the process of doing. And so, you know, how valuable is 
a spiritual family? How much benefit can that be? I think you know that we can all appreciate that. We can see our responsibility in that, and we can you know, be thankful you know that God is the one, even if we are a little flock, and even if we are you know under duress, uh, that He uh, not only will see us through, uh, but He will uh, carry us into the kingdom. And that, of course, is a, a very positive, very optimistic thing to think about. So I am thankful to see all of you today. Glad that you know we're able to meet together and that we can continue to do so uh, with uh, joy, because that's what God wants. But joy, as we uh, serve one another, as we appreciate one another, as we're thankful for the spiritual family, actually the mother that God has given us. Uh, to be able uh, to grow and thrive and ultimately be brought forth in birth.